So it, it's, it's, it's hard to minimize, or it's uh, hard to exaggerate, rather, uh, how transformative these technologies were to neurology. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I still have colleagues who practice neurology, beginning practicing neurology before the advent of MRI and CAT, and, and, and CAT scan you know, in the 1960s and 70s. And, and it's, it's, it's a completely different period for people like me who came on board when these technologies were developed because it completely transformed the way we could visualize things like stroke, tumors in the brain, inflammation, infection. Um, it's nearly trivial to visualize these disorders now uh, once a patient presents with, with, with symptoms that we think are stroke, tumor, infection. But it's uh, interesting to point out that Alzheimer's disease and related disorders ha have not been readily visualized by these first uh, technical innovations. So it was not possible to visualize Alzheimer's summarize, there are three stages through which Alzheimer's progresses within an area of the brain. Cell sickness, histological stage, and cell death stage. And so we now have techniques, imaging techniques, that can capture each of these stages. There are, there are imaging MRI volumetric techniques are called, that can actually see the shrinkage of the brain as cell death occurs. There are now these really quite remarkable techniques using positron emission tomography PET that use ligands that allow us to actually see amyloid plaques and nerve fibular tangles in the living brain. It's really quite uh, uh, remarkable. But we focused our attention on that earliest stage, the cell sickness stage of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, it might be self-evident, but um, we, we figured that that's the stage that would be most amenable to therapeutic intervention. I think it is obvious to say that treating uh, sick cells easier, is easier than treating a dead cell. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to uh, try to capture that earliest stages uh, of the disease. Um, and that turned out to have some challenges, which we, in large part, and this is not just really um, uh, you know, being a cheerleader for our in large part because the FAR believed in us early on. When, you know, when you're developing new technologies, uh, there's a lot of skepticism, as there should be. Uh, and, and, and thankfully, we were able to live up to the expectations of the FAR grants in, in showing that we can now uh, use some of these imaging techniques to capture that early stage, uh, is uh, trying to get at underlying mechanisms of disease. Okay. So if, if, in fact, one area of the hippocampus is targeted by Alzheimer's first and foremost, you know, it truly is you know, a thumbnail or, or a pinky nail size of the brain, the whole brain, the whole body, that's where Alzheimer's starts. Why does it start there? Right. If we can figure that out at the molecular level, it might tell us what is the fundamental cause of Alzheimer's disease. If we've now pinpointed the equivalent site in the brain for Alzheimer's disease, and now we want to find out well, what's going wrong, what's, what, what is it about that site that makes it so vulnerable? And we've actually completed a series of studies where we can look at the molecules, the proteins in these areas of the brain between patients and controls, and we've identified a novel molecular pathway We've now confirmed this with animal models, and this is a whole story unto itself. We've confirmed it with genetics. Uh, and so we now think we have a clue into it, a, a, a basic mechanism that might be contributing to Alzheimer's disease. And as a final point, let me remind you that the reason why the first generation drugs uh, don't work very effectively, Aricept, and Rinda, you might have heard of them, is because they don't get at the core molecular problem. And it's sort of a basic principle in neuropharmacology, or pharmacology in general, that the best way to fix something to really know, know what's broken at the molecular level. So we now think we're getting handles. I can't pretend that this is the whole story, but it's certainly a contributing story. And we're now going gangbusters trying to develop drugs to correct this problem we found in the small area of the brain. And when, they, when they called me a few months ago to ask if I would talk tonight, uh, it was easy to say yes for a number of reasons. First, because it's one of our mandates as academicians to share what we do and not to just uh, live in the ivory. Uh, but also, particularly because of the FAR, because <coughs> the, the research, the, the funding that they, uh, uh, that, that I received from them early on was really uh, fundamental in accelerating my research project, and I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And, um, you know, the Beeson Scholar Award is one of the most uh, competitive and prestigious awards to receive, uh, and it's, uh, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, I see younger colleagues get them, and, and you can just hear the, um, the, the, the whoop of Joy when uh, a new scholar receives these awards. They really are uh, one of the premier awards in the field. And um, you know, I think FR has really done a great job in 
choosing and selecting the, the leaders. And, and if you look at the leaders of aging across uh, the country, uh, now, that, now that the visa has been uh, nearly 20 years, or 16, 16 uh, you know, chairman, uh, head of centers, uh, awardees of numerous awards, uh, uh, are typically uh, people who received uh, 